<laughs> Sorry about that. Do you want me to turn the mic on? It's again? the first time, please. please. Yeah, that would help. Yeah. Yes. It's the first time I've given a mainstream lecture, despite the fact that I've been a member of the BSD for over 25 years. So I've done plenty of other presentations. But uh, one always asks for some sort of feedback after you've done something. And uh, on previous occasions, the feedback's been pretty universal. And I can summarize it in one sentence. Jim's presentation was very interesting, but I didn't understand a single word about it. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is experiment on you all today. So instead of going down in silos and taking individual topics, I'm going to go right across the top, okay? So I want to start off with stuff at a cosmic level and then gradually work my way down through our scenario down to subquantum level, okay? But we're going to include you and the whole idea of consciousness within that model, okay? Now, I must explain something which is becoming blindingly obvious, even to Joe public, and that is that the world of mainstream science is in crisis, okay? I'm talking particularly here about the whole idea of astronomy or cosmic studies. Okay. We have uh, just had the passing of Mr. Hawking, okay, who was obviously a leader in the scenario of what he called black holes. Okay. Uh, I will come a bit more on to that. And all of this work, and much of the mainstream work in academia these days, is based on work that was started in the early part of the 20th century, and that was all down to Mr. Albert Einstein. And you probably heard the expression of space-time. Uh, well, the whole of that scenario has permeated physics, in particular, for well over a hundred years now. The problem is that it is based on this force that we call gravity. Now there's one real problem with gravity. It is so damn weak, okay, compared with other forces in the universe that it can't possibly hold things together, okay? I'll say a lot more about that. And the other thing is that we are really talking about communication in the universe at the so-called speed of light, which is supposedly the fastest thing that things can travel at, around about, I think, 86,000 miles per second. That is absolute peanuts of speed because that means that it takes well over eight minutes for a pulse of light to come from the sun to us here. If that's just between our solar, our system here, our Earth, and our solar system, this is peanuts compared with the size of the cosmos, which we know, now know. I think the work that's been going on for years in terms of space technology, I'm talking about probes, telescopes, all of this sort of thing, the information which is being gathered is totally incredible. The trouble is that mainstream science is just simply not catching up with this at all. So we need a completely new model. And what's happening now is there has been a rise of a, I would say, a new, a new concept. In fact, it's not new at all because it goes back a long time. But it's called the electric universe. Okay? And the electric force, not surprisingly, 
is considerably stronger in terms of its ability to draw things together than this force of gravity. In fact, it is what we call 10 to the power 39. So if you're not into mathematical notation, that's 10 with 39 noughts behind it, stronger than gravity. Mainstream science ignores this force at its peril. Okay? And I am very much involved in the electric universe movement, as many people around the world now are. Okay? And we had the first international meeting here in the UK at Bath about a month or so ago. Dramatic gathering of people, unification of people. And mainstream science is starting to get very worried about this sort of thing. <laughs> they have meetings all over the world to talk about all of these things you've heard about. We've mentioned black holes. You've heard of terms such as dark matter, dark energy, oh, all of this sort of stuff. And when their jigsaw puzzle doesn't fit together, they say, ah, we must be missing another particle. And particles always end in O-N. So you've probably heard of protons and electrons and so on. Okay? Uh, and when there was a conference in just a few, well, a year or two back in Lausanne about this sort of thing, somebody said, it's so elusive, we'll call the next particle the chameleon particle. <laughs> So it changes its colour depending on what we need it to be. And there are new theories coming out all the time, but this is a total, utter disaster for physics. But it's all based on the fact that funding, particularly from the EU, is such that people who start off studying one thing continue to study it for the rest of their life. Okay. So, that is the background. What about us? I think that we, the Dowsing Fraternity, have a great opportunity here to contribute significantly to mainstream science. And I think the reason for this really is that we are dealing with the so-called mind, okay? Now, the concept of the mind is very ancient, as you well know. But mind and matter are the two things that have been argued about for so, so long. Mainstream science, the physiologists of this world, believe that this thing we call consciousness emerges from inside three pounds of granite. Garbage! Okay? We and everything else in the universe is just like a sponge in the ocean. Think of the ocean as being the total cosmos and the sponge are every single object within that enormous ocean. We are soaking up all of this energy. In other words, it sweeps through us. Our three pounds of grey matter is just like a router on your computer, linking to computers all over the world. So if you send an email, it may end up cut as well on some computer. For all I know, some of my work may be on some computer in the bowels of the Kremlin or something like that. That's all, that's the way it's organized in this day and age. But we have to think about a new way of moving forward. So, if we are in difficulty about communicating with the standard electromagnetic field, what's really happening? If this whole scenario about do we respond to things all over the cosmos, we have to take into account the fact that things really are from here to there are instantaneous. Okay. So, 
Let's start throwing one or two charts together, if we could just tell the first one. <coughs> I'm going to pull together stuff right across the board, okay? And this is nothing to do with size particularly. This is just a picture of a picture. It's in fact an artistic drawing. Simply an artistic drawing, but an artist's concept of something or other. And if you have a look at this, you'll see that it's got various shapes associated with it. And those who've had to suffer me over the years uh, I think I've got a total hook onto this thing called a toroid, okay, or a toroidal shape. But you, your energy field, is precisely that shape. So you can't escape from toroids, okay? So there's the basic ring, the basic toroid. <clears throat> and you can see the way the spiral going around it, like that, okay? Going around. And perhaps the, the more significant thing is the fact that that spiral has other spirals going around it. Okay? And spirals upon spirals. Just bear that in mind. Because I just throw something for you to think about in the meanwhile. We all understand about, or we talk about, different dimensions, higher dimensional space. Physics hasn't got a clue, really, how to look at that, apart from a set of numbers. But here is a physical model for you, whereby the waves go around waves, and waves on top of waves. So if you go up from one wave, spiraling wave, to the next one, you are going into a higher dimension. Just a thought. Next one, please. <coughs> so, here I'm really summarizing very quickly the problem. We've talked about space time, Mr. Einstein, and how Mr. Hawking has used Einstein's theory. Uh, and this has led to the concept of black holes, okay? Now, if if you've ever heard Brian Cox going on about this, you'll know what we're talking about. Black holes are sinkholes. Everything from the universe goes into a black hole and disappears. Now, what many people don't know, and this applies also to the scientific community, uh, is that two years ago, Mr. Hawking published a paper in which he said, Essentially, the bottom line was, black holes are not black, they are grey. Now what he means by this is that effectively, we all have a leaky bucket. In other words, the energy from the universe is dripping out underneath, and that is why he called it a grey hole. In other words, black holes are a sheer mathematical <coughs> proposition, not reality. And this was just joy to my eyes because, my ears, because I've been playing around with what's wrong with black holes for God knows how long, okay? And so we're starting to move back again to something which might just be sensible science. But the other thing that really is a problem in science is this thing called gravity, as I mentioned, okay? And it is such a weak force, but it is not a primary force. If you really stand back from physics and analyze it, it is not a primary force. Okay. Gravity emerges out of things that spin. Okay. And the also, this thing is everything on the planet we organize according to a time shape. And we think time is a magic pyramid as well. But then we all soon learn at school that time is due to the rotation of the Earth on its own axis. And this is how we calculate time. Okay. So the two key parameters of mainstream science, gravity and time, are not primary parameters. They are emergent parameters.
Now I've come back to this slide, which is a body slide for a five-year-old, and I've already made this point about us, okay, and the fact that mainstream science believes that it really, science really operates as like this picture on the left-hand side, whereby our brain, our thought processes, are all in these two right-handed and left-handed brain uh, cells in our uh, units in our head, okay? But now I've explained to you about the problems with the speed of light and everything else. We know that to describe the universe, we have to have some mechanism which means here is effectively there from the communication point of view. In other words, instantaneous transmission of information right across the universe. And so the model we are playing around with is the one you see on the right, where <laughs> we are totally immersed in this cosmic field of energy. Okay? And we have to really then look at what this cosmic theme is all about. I'm going to introduce some technical terms that some of you may have heard of, other than maybe you're completely new to you, but I'll describe them just for reference purposes. This field of energy is really in the scientific world called the bosonic field. B-O-S-O-N-I-C, field. Okay. And this is after, named after a remarkable Indian scientist uh, who held the chair of physics uh, in, I can't quite remember where at the moment on the top of my head, uh, in, in India uh, in the beginning of the last century. Uh, and he was Satyendra Bose, B-O-S-E. Now, the other side, the, the, the material side of the world, are called fermions. And back to our O-N again, fermions, okay, or fermionic uh, material, you might say. And that's after Enrico Fermi, who was a very extrovert Italian uh, physicist who influenced things in the 1930s in particular. So we have these two things. Okay? Fermions, which describes the matter world, and bosons, which describe effectively the mind world. So we're dividing mind and matter. Okay. What's this all got to do with Dowsing? Well, the thing is, Dowsing is all to do with the boson world and how we translate that into the fermionic world how we get our thought processes, turning our thought processes into things that are solid. And I'm going to talk a little bit later on about the numbers involved in this, because the whole of the universe is based on numbers. Okay? And the new model we are evolving within the Dowsing Research Group is really based on this concept of universal harmonics. And the two numbers, which would not come as a surprise to you, are the numbers two and three. Okay? You can say, well, that's very simple, and it is. We'll talk a little bit more about this. But three, the number three, refers to this mind field, okay? And the number two, regards to everything that's manifested on this planet and elsewhere in the cosmos. Another one, please. Now then, if Mr. Hawking got things wrong, it's because he wasn't really considering the structure, the fundamental structure of objects in the universe. And this is a picture I think it's a beautiful picture. Don't ask me what the number of the galaxy is. I can't remember off the top of my head. But you will see that we have two of these rings, these toroidal rings. Okay? And 
can we have a sphere between them? And these are balanced. And that, and that is the specific form of a galaxy. Okay? But you'll see it's rather fluffy in terms of this basic material in it, or it looks like it in the picture. And this is because the matter is in a, what we call a plasma state. Okay? Now, you know the word plasma applied to blood, and this has been around for well over 100 years. But in the 1930s, it started to be applied to another state of matter, the plasma field, or the plasma material. And you say, oh, I haven't heard of anything like this before. But in fact, you meet it every day. Because I'm damn sure that these lights and things like that are plasma lights. Okay? And if you go into any supermarket, you see these rows of plasma lights, okay, which are tubes of gas in a certain volume, you might say, in a certain density, with electric charge through it. And this was discovered in the 19th century, <coughs> putting electric current through this allows these things to glow. Okay. Very white light. These things happen to kill me to death, actually. I can't see in the supermarket at all. Okay. So it's not necessarily good for all of us, but in fact, that's become universal. And the plasma state is well over 99% of the state of matter in the cosmos. 99%. And it's not built into the fundamental models of particles of physics we know today. So we are throwing away the baby with the bathroom. Okay, to use that old expression. The plasma state is in fact a form of gas, you would say. And what, what is it like? Well, you're probably familiar with the fact that in the atomic world we have the nucleus of the atom and the electrons which move around the core of the atom, the proton. And if they are separated and not moving around in structures, just free, freely floating around, that is the plasma state. And it is possible, by applying electric fields to this plasma, to organize the plasma into some quite remarkable structures. And here, you see the galaxy. Okay. We'll say more about this. We have the next slide. I talked about the shape of things. There are only three shapes you can have. This follows from fundamental mathematics. And we've already talked on two of them. The toroidal shape, which was shown you on the last picture, the sphere, which doesn't surprise you, and the point part. I don't worry too much about the point because it's got no structure, it is a point, okay? But nevertheless, mathematically, we have to have those three things. So in the practical world, we have these spherical shapes linked into these toroidal shapes. And our auric field embodies both of those shapes. And I'm showing below the drawing of the organization of our solar system, okay, which we thought until fairly recently was the only one. Now we know there are at least hundreds of other solar systems, but we won't dwell on that for the moment. And these shapes we can apply to the structure of the solar system. And I'll say, if I get time, a little bit more about how we can update models of the solar system to accommodate these topologies, as we call them. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what shapes can emerge? Well, I'm calling this chart cosmic drum, okay? Because 
You may be familiar with something that occurred in about the 18th century. It's called originally Trapney's Figures. I don't know if people are familiar with that, but it was essentially a brass plate, if I remember rightly in those days, stuck on a pole, and you sprinkle light sand over it, and then you get a violin bow, and you move it at different points on this plate, and you get wonderful patterns emerging. This is a way in which order can emerge out of apparent chaos. And you can do this experiment, and it's been done many times, with a big bass drum, okay, orchestral big bass drum, and you spray or sprinkle sand all over it, and you just hit it with a stick in different places, and you get wonderful shapes. Okay? And if you get things right, you can generally rings the sand which emulate position of the planets in our solar system. Okay? So this is the way in which order could emerge from chaos. And we can say a lot more about this sort of thing in terms of how we apply this, not just to our solar system, but to the, the whole of the cosmos. The next, next one. Now I said I would go right across the board, so I'm going right from galaxies and the total cosmos down to the subatomic world, okay? So what's the shape of everything? Well, there were some, many of you will be familiar with this, a lot of work in the beginning of the 20th century, and she had this remarkable ability to view into things, okay? And she viewed, she, she viewed various objects to try to find the smallest object she could find, or topology she could find, okay? And this is the shape she came up with, okay? This one here. And when I'm describing it to people, I forgot to bring it with me now, is it's really just like or a string. The fundamental particle of the cosmos looks like a ball of string you can buy from your local stations. Okay. It's got this hole in the middle and it's got windings of string in two dimensions. Okay. Two dimensions. It's interesting that as an aside that physics to try to solve some problems about is it a particle, is it a word, had in fact the idea of a complete concept of string theory, and it was known as <coughs> string theory. But I always ask the question, where does the string go? Is it, is it a bit like a little aeroplane tying one of these bands behind it, okay, in a piece of string, and waves going on it? <coughs> That's total nonsense. It is in fact like a very fine string that's wound around into this toroidal shape. Just bear that in mind. So remember, the shape of a particle in physics is essentially a ball of string, full stop. <coughs> and we've done a lot of work in the Gaza Research Group, which I'm certainly not going to explain today, to show how we can look at the numbers of the cosmos and link it to the model that Annie Besant came up with in terms of the winding of the string. And these are called spirella, just for, just for reference purposes. Now then, you're probably more familiar <coughs> with galaxies instead of the beta royal rings. These wonderful patterns up here, I could just, just call them discus shapes. And these, these are galaxies, <clears throat> and they cause an enormous amount of problem in physics due to their rotation. 
because the theories suggest that, strictly speaking, one of these galaxies should revolve essentially, essentially it's going around faster in the middle and slower on the outside getting slower. So the speed is not the same going from the centre to the outside. And they say, they say that there must be some missing mass to make sure we can get this thing spinning as we think it should be spinning as a solid object. And this is the origin of the term which you will have heard, even in the popular press, dark matter. Now the problem is that after at least 50 years, half a century of looking for dark matter, it ain't been found, okay? And there are very good reasons it hasn't been found, because the truth is you don't need it. Okay? And the model that we're coming up with at the moment, you begin to see this, you can see it from the side here, where in this case we have a central sphere but then we have a toroid around it. And then around that toroid, we have another one, and another one. But these are getting smaller and smaller as we go further out. Okay? And when you start to analyze this, I will throw it into the pot straight away. The ratio of the size of one of these spheres, it's actually a ring, of course, to the one inside it, all comes down to, wait for it, a major tone on the diatonic scale. It's like just going from one tone upwards on the piano. And I'll talk quite a bit about that. Now that's quite interesting, isn't it? Does it mean anything? Highly significant. Highly significant. And the numbers associated with this shape all relate to the musical scale. Next one. So I've already touched on numbers and we all at school, at least certainly I did, learned to count from one to ten and play with numbers like that. I have to tell you that's not quite right. Okay? Because what we should be doing is counting from naught to nine. Still not ten associated with it, but naught to nine. And maybe you haven't heard of the modular nine number system, but it was certainly known to the Sumerians. So in round figures, 6000 BC. And what? I would like to do, not necessarily now, but it's, it's, it's handy for you, look at your mobile phones, okay? And the keypad, because you play around every day with modular nine system, and you probably don't realize it, okay? And so, just look at the keyboard here. The keyboard of any telephone these days, digital telephone, or indeed a mobile phone, is laid out on 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and the north is below it. Okay? And the interesting thing is that if you take the numbers on the telephone, 1 plus 2 plus 3 is the number below it on the right hand side, 6. Okay? And the other arrangement of these three numbers. 1 times 2 times 3 is 6. Isn't that wonderful? The two basic processes of mathematics that you learn when being 5 to 10 years of age come together at the number 6. Number 6 is the key number of the universe. And every single atom in your body, or lots of things in chemistry generally, <coughs> are six-sided figures, okay, hexagons. Okay. And that is, God knows what percentage of the organization of the universe, but it's well into the 99.99 something or other, okay? So, 
here we have a number system which is starting to show us how things are really put together. Okay. We could come back to that if necessary. Let's just move on and see where we need to be. Now I suspect that many people in this audience who in their youth were forced to try to learn the piano, okay? I tried not much success, <laughs> but my dear wife is very well known up in Yorkshire for her ability not only to play in her youth but to teach music to young kids. <coughs> absolutely wonderful to see a seven-year-old having an attempt at playing a concert. Okay. That's a bit of an aside, but the point I am making is all about the layout of the keyboard. Because we talk about middle C, okay, and then we go up an octave. And for reference purposes, Little C is generally tuned to 256 cycles a second. By British, 256 cycles a second. And when we go up to the upper C, here presto, our number two comes into play. 512. Yeah. But the key element, the key note in that is what we call a major sixth, and that is from C to A. Okay. And that A is really the keynote, the most fundamental note of how orchestras are tuned up. And we come to a very sensitive point in music because. The tuning of pianos, or indeed total orchestra, orchestras in general, was changed in 1953 with a big convention in London, and they changed the tuning of A to 440 cycles a second, whereby the fundamental number, which emerged from the Sumerians and was taken over originally into music, right up to let's say Vivaldi and Verdi's time, and that was 432 cycles a second. 432. 4 plus 3 is 7, plus 2 is 9. Okay. This is absolute key, pardon me your expression, to the whole of the organization, not only the piano, but the cosmos in general, and of course you, or every living thing. And we have these numbers two and three, which were taken up by certainly Pythagoras, okay, many years ago, okay, centuries ago. Okay. And we the mixture of these two, applied to the piano scale, gave rise to a term called the Pythagorean comma. If you play around with the numbers two and three, two to the power three is eight, okay, three to the power two is nine, nine over eight is a major tone. It don't quite match up all the way around. And this is why pianos are tuned to what we call equal temperament. In other words, they are not tuned to the proper intervals. So and even a concert pianist is not playing exactly right because it's the way the tuning goes. Okay? It's all to do with the ratio of numbers. Certainly I'm going into that. But these numbers such as 9 over 8 or, uh, or other, other numbers 2 to 1, God knows what, they are fundamental to the universe. So, Piano tuning is 
is a very good indicator of the whole of physics. And the number 432, I mentioned the tuning, if you divide it by the number that you're all very familiar with, probably the only number you remember from your school physics or your school mathematics, is the number pi, which is just over 3, okay? So 432 over pi gives you a number which is universal to the whole of physics, called a fine structure constant, 137.036, okay? And this non-matching of things tuned to 3 and 2 <coughs> It's called a Pythagorean common. And things in physics don't quite tie up. Okay? It's a bit like having one hand when you put them over one other. One finger might be shorter than the other. Okay? The left hand and the right hand side don't quite match up. So the Pythagorean common is in fact fundamental to the whole of a new breed of mathematics which grew up in the last couple of decades. But it's really waves between low C and upper C okay, that are important. And the intervals are absolutely crucial. Next one. Now then, I mentioned to you the whole thing about communication. A mainstream science says you've got to do with electromagnetics and all the rest of it. The same thing that operates your mobile phones. Garbage. Okay? You have all, I'm sure many of you, will be very familiar with identical twins. And if you had any dealing with identical twins, you know that they have a special capability. And in the States, I know that every year they have a gathering of groups of identical twins. I can't remember where they hold it. But there are literally hundreds of identical twins. And a commonality they share is the sort of thing that we're now really homing in on as regards doubt. Because if you have two identical twins, say one in the UK and the other in, say, Australia, and the one in the UK falls down, grazes its knee and goes, ouch. The one in Australia says, ouch, on the same knee at precisely the same time. This is a very common phenomenon, extremely well documented, and this is why we have identical twin societies. <coughs> now this instantaneous communication is in fact something which we can really analyze in detail when we are talking about the quantum and there's a phenomenon in the quantum physics, the subatomic world we're talking about now, going back to the early 19th century, uh, which really looks at this whole phenomenon. It's called quantum non-locality. And what physicists do not really understand yet is that this whole thing about quantum non-locality, where if you take two atoms together, and then, once they've been together, and the, the spinning, they all spin like the Earth, okay, at a very small level. And if you separate them as far as you possibly can, and then you turn the spin axis of one through 90 degrees, the other one turns instantaneously. Communication is instantaneous. Okay. And quantum non-locality is just like the identical twin. Now you can begin to see, I hope, how dowsing is beginning to work. You can communicate with anything and you are effectively using quantum non-locality. You are using a basic, well-established phenomenon in mainstream science to do your dowsing. I just show this because I think this is 
really getting back to the fundamentals of what went wrong with science. Isn't that a wonderful picture in its own right? I think it is. And you'll recognize it as the aurora, okay? Aurora Borealis in Norway. Now there's a very famous Norwegian physicist called Christian Berkeland. And he studied the aurora, obviously in his native Norway, in great detail. And he was able to really put a bit of this plasma, that's what it really is, or it's essentially the environment around us, or the sky around us, in the plasma state. He put it into a bottle and effectively created it in the laboratory, the aurora borealis, a small scale. So the idea of an electric universe is not new. It is well over a century old. I'm not going into the history of how this was thrown out by a rather arrogant scientist who decided that that was not the right way to go, another way was, was the right way. But we took a wrong turn in science in about the 1920s. <coughs> but this idea of a plasma universe, okay, and when we come on to it, I'll talk about all the spirals associated with this, really goes back well over a hundred and it's really based on that line. And we just had this afternoon in one of the, I think it was just next door, a workshop session. And of course I doused the energy line system and I found, much to my delight, that there was in fact a Birkeland current flowing through the room. You will find them in your back garden. Uh, everywhere, okay? And every single medieval church in Britain, every single stone circle, genuine stone circle, around the world is built on a grid network of what we call Birkeland currents. And in very simple terms, it's as if when we're going towards a church, along, let's say, the magnetic north line and through a village church. You are in a, effectively a bosonic tunnel. You can't see it, of course, with your normal eyes. But you are, in fact, a tube. Okay? And the centre line of this tube has got another spiral in it. And I'm not going to deal with that because that, when it comes to the centre of the church, the crossover there, you went, I'm going to talk a bit more about this. I think I've got a chart or two. So the centre part of the church, underneath the tower, is in fact an acupuncture point on this network in the earth. And these Birkeland currents, as we call them, are just like slinky toys going on the earth. Okay? And they cover not only all around the earth, they are all the way through the cosmos. It's as if we had this grid network all over the cosmos. So galaxies are just like churches in that they are on the crossover points of these Berkeley current lines. On the Earth they're going east, west, north, south on the magnetic but we'll come on to more details later on, if necessary. So you begin to see what we're doing is down. When we go out and down as a church, we can map out all of these Birkeland currents on the ground. And I've done it in many, well, many, many times, all over the world, and it's all the same. Okay. And this has got the fundamental structure of these spirals. And these Birkeland currents have a particular spiral angle. So if it's spiraling up like that, the angle associated with it is 36 degrees. Now, I don't know if you remember as far back as 1953, the structure of DNA is revealed by Crick and Watson. And when they analyzed the DNA structure, they found that it had a spiral angle 
36 degrees. We have every single cell in our body has the same basic structure as a Birkeland current which we can find even in this building. And in fact, you can go all over the world. There are 13,000 medieval churches in Britain, thereabouts, and they are all built on the crossover of these Eligioline systems. And those networks of lines, right angles to one another, go right the way through the cosmos. As I said before, the spiraling motion is just like the identical twin scenario that if you put a message in one end, it's instantaneously in the other. Time don't exist. So this is what it's all about. Next one, we'll try try moving on a bit. Getting down to something which is more directly connected with Dowsing. This is a picture of me, believe it or not. Uh, many, many years ago, early nights, I can't remember which year, I was invited to give a weekend seminar at uh, Hazelwood in, in the West Country. Okay? And uh, at lunchtime they said to me, we have a single standing stone down by the river, but we've no idea about why it's there, what it does, this, that and the other. Can you have a look at it? And when I went down there, I found, needless to say, it had a beautiful acupuncture point around it. And I, and I thought, well, hang, and the energy of mine is going through, it, as I've explained to you. And I got my dear wife to, to take a photograph of me with the first generation of digital cameras, nothing fancy at all. And I said to her, there's the line there, just move back. I said, oh, two or three more yards like that, and okay. I'll stand touching the stone, take a photograph. And this is what came out. We were, in fact, releasing this plasma energy from the stone. And I have a little picture here, and I could show you, but if you just slightly change the contrast, you get this picture here, and you can see the plasma around it. And that was the first time I discovered that you can douse photographs, far too, photographs taken with even simple camera technology, absorb, if that's the right expression, the elements or the structure of the plasma field. And plasma is all to do with, as I said before, spinning like the DNA, might be purple currents, this spiraling motion. So there's a universal field derived from me just standing there touching the stone. And we have lots of data on this. And you can start to build the structure of the energy field around it. You'll see that I've got the shell of energy, and I talked about the sphere, which goes underneath the ground, okay, you might be not surprised by that. And you can put in all these rings, toroidal rings, all around one another. And in fact, when you analyse Mr. Hawking's idea, that model gives rise to the same results that he was suggesting when we had this data well over 10 years ago, okay, at least. Okay. So here we are. We're now back really into dowsing. The position of where my wife should stand was something I danced on because I could find the energy of my system. Next one. And these are the acupuncture points, the shape of the acupuncture points in every church. And you will see we call them colloquially spiders web patterns. And you can see why. Because we have a series of nested rings. This is a two-dimensional version, of course, but they're really taller, nested toys. 
Now we usually have a gradient, it's obviously north, south, east, west, but we have 45 degree lines as well. Generally, okay, not always, okay, 32.6 inches in round figures, okay. And this was then figured out by Alexander Tom, which I know some of you are quite familiar with Alexander Tom's work. He was, uh, held a chair in physics at one of the London colleges, but he was primarily he, studied, he worked at the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. Now I was never privileged to meet Alexander Tom, but his co-worker, John Allen, Professor John Allen, is a very good friend of mine and I worked with John for 30 odd years or so. So I do have, I feel, some sort of link with Alexander Tom. But this 2.72 feet is really quite intriguing because I'd like to just mention something else. I've worked many years ago now on the Mexican side, Teotihuacan, uh, which is a mine site, as you know. And if you've seen any of the programs on Central America, wonderful programs by Diego Cooper, who was the curator for the <coughs> He said, when we analyzed all the data at we found that it seemed to be built to a unit of measurement. He said, and it's, it was 83 centimeters. So of course, needless to say, he completely lost the plot because he should have measured it in inches. And needless to say, it was 2.72 feet. And of course, I wrote to him and said, hang on a minute, mate. <coughs> this has been known for a long, long time. And it occurs everywhere around the world. And 2.72 feet is the unit because it was given to us by the Sumerians. Okay? So we've known all about it for at least 6,000 years. Did I get a reply? I don't know what to tell <laughs> So this is the basic pattern we get at the crossover of these energy lines, essentially north, south, east, west lines. Okay, next one. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Oh yes, okay. I talked to you about this. I talked to you about this whole thing about columnar vortices, okay? In fact, with Karen this afternoon, we've just discovered that some of her, her drawings generate these columnar vortices, which are just like the ones that I'm showing you here. Okay? These are rings around one another. And I have in here the structure which really explains absolutely everything to do with standing stones and indeed archaeological sites, generally speaking. <laughs> so we know the basic underlying mathematics. If we just move on, move on to another slide. <coughs> I would just like to so, is this new? Not a bit of it, okay? Because here is Saturn, and you all know Saturn, and you know about the rings. And in fact, the rings within Saturn around here, they are Bertrand currents, and they have exactly the same structure that we find here in this hall. And these great big gas giants are all built. Jupiter's just the same. It's like toroidal rings on top of toroidal rings, okay, with a little ball on the top. And you can see all the spirals, particularly on Jupiter. You can see the spirals going around, just like my first picture that I showed you. Okay. We just have another one or two, I think. I think you've got the general idea. I think 
this is a good one to finish with, okay? Because these toroidal rings are totally universal. In this day of non-smoking, perhaps we don't see people blowing smoke rings, okay, with their cigarettes, but I have to tell you that dolphins are the wonderful example of blowing smoke rings and them rising to the surface, breaking through the surface and collapsing, okay, and generating these rings. These are fairy rings, but the dolphins do it. And perhaps I should just finish by saying that I've had a couple of sessions working with dolphins, once in Florida with a couple, and another couple in a Caribbean island. And uh, particularly the latter, I remember it being a very small lake, okay, that they, they were in, but were, and then I came along and started talking to them, okay, and you can't communicate with dolphins. You do it in terms of pictures, okay, not words. And they obviously thought to themselves, here comes a real Charlie, okay? Because at the end of the day, I was having them going round in circles like this, okay? And there was a bit of debris in the, in the lake, okay? And they were pushing it around just as I was telling them to push it around, okay? And this is the sort of thing they do. The dolphin process of blowing from below this cross line of energy and blowing from below like that and the toroid coming through, breaking through the surface, gives rise to these sorts of shapes. And this is fundamental. And this is absolutely the fundamental process of the creation of crops. And we have many examples now. Lucy can vouch for all of this, is that we can, in fact, induce the creation of crop circles. Mm. And I'll just finish with one example. I don't think we're trying to show, to show the picture. But essentially, I remember it's going back many years. I was playing around with what the possibilities were mathematically for the shape of crop circles. And I came up with rings with bindings around it, just like my first picture. And I gave a lecture to the Wiltshire Crop Circle group. And I remember the question, one of the young ladies standing up at the end and asking the question. What do you want to see in the fields this year? Okay. And I said, I'd love to see something like the shape I've shown you in the fields. Okay. Never thought any more about it. Okay. I remember about two or three weeks later, the telephone rang at tea time, lifted the phone up. Francine here, okay. she runs the group. It's arrived for you, she said. <laughs> and then we looked at a particular picture, or we went to analyze the crop circle. It was virtually identical with the one that I had worked out theoretically a week or two before. But I got one or two things wrong. And the crop circle was telling me what I had gone. So there we are. Okay? I think we're going to have to leave it at that. But I hope I've given you the feeling that we are totally linked to everything else. The numbers involved in this process have been known for a long, long time. We must go back at least when we're doing scientific work, to the foot pound seconds and other th words, things that we all are taught at school. That goes back to 
the Sumerians. Yeah. <coughs> but you probably all remember that it's something like 5,280 feet in a mile. If you take the numbers 5 to 8, 5 to 8 cycles a second was used to vibrate a device in the Caribbean when we had that great oil spill there. And the frequency of 528 was used to clean up the oil spill. I can give you thousands of examples of how harmonics really leads to absolutely everything in the universe. Okay? And it is, in fact, the key to the whole of Darcy. We are measuring the fundamental numbers of the cosmos. And those of you who go to, let's say, Stonehenge or Avebury, and you know that there are ditches there, that's the bottom half of the toroidal theme which goes around. <coughs> Absolutely everything is connected from the subatomic world to ourselves, our planet, our interaction with it, and our interaction with the galaxy in general. And I think that our solar system is now one of so many in the cosmos that must surely be another civilization like us who evolved elsewhere. Who knows? Thank you very much.